Cedarville College is pleased to present Answers with Ken Ham. A 12-part video series defending the Bible from the very first verse. Today's question, is there really a God? And now, Ken Ham. I was a high school biology teacher in Australia for a number of years. You know, the students knew that I was a Christian because I made that very, very clear. And one of the questions I often received from some of the students was this. Sir, if you believe the Bible, if you believe that it's the Word of God, it says in the very first verse, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Well, where did God come from? How do we know there's a God? Who made God? I'm sure you've all heard questions like that before, haven't you? And how do we answer those sort of questions? Who made God? Where did God come from? You know, Carl Sagan, who is an ardent evolutionist, anti-creationist, the late Dr. Carl Sagan, he said this, the cosmos is all it is or ever was or ever will be. You know, when you think about it, the Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Carl Sagan said, in the beginning the cosmos. They're sort of a little different, aren't they, those views? <laughs> very, very different, aren't they? And in fact, how different are they? Well, in the beginning, God created would mean that God created you. It means he owns you. It means he sets the rules. It means you're accountable to him. But in the beginning, the cosmos, what does that mean? It means no one owns you. It means you're accountable to no one, and you can set the rules. Now, I want us to think about this for a moment because it's very, very important. What you believe about where you came from affects your whole worldview. And that's why it's very important to understand the difference between in the beginning God created or in the beginning the cosmos. You know, Romans 1.20 in the Bible says this, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. You know what Paul says? There's enough evidence in the world to convince everyone that God is creator. If you don't believe, you're without excuse. Well, where's that evidence? You know, 1 Peter 3.15 is a very important passage, I believe, for us, because it says that we should always be ready to give reasons for what we believe. We should always be ready to defend our faith. And so, if in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth is true, and if Christianity is, is a true faith, then it should be consistent with what we see around us, shouldn't it? And we should be able to logically defend our faith. And so that's what I want to do in this particular session. I want to teach us how to logically defend our faith to show those who don't believe in God that they are without excuse, as Paul says in Romans 1.20. How would I explain to my children to, about how, ans how to answer those questions, like, where did God come from? How do we know there's a God? Well, as you came in here to this auditorium, I'm sure like me, you looked around and said, wow, got here by an explosion in a brick factory. Is that what you said? <laughs> no, not at all. You know it didn't get here by chance random processes. You know that intelligence was put into this, don't you? You know that it was designed. You can see the evidence for design. You can see the evidence that intelligence is behind things. Or take Mount Rushmore. You know the president's heads that are there on Mount Rushmore? My favorite president is there, by the way, Abraham Lincoln. I don't know whether you know why he's my favorite president, but I really get embarrassed when people in America ask me if I'm a living fossil or something like that. But, uh, <laughs> I guess I think I'll look like Abraham Lincoln. But, but how did those presidents' heads get there? You know, I've got a theory. What do you think about this? I think what happened was this. I think millions of years of wind and water erosion acting on Mount Rushmore uh, eventually produced the presidents' heads. Now, of course not. You know that didn't happen. You know that there was a sculptor who worked for many, many years uh, to design those heads. In other words, again, you could recognize the effect of intelligence, the, that you can recognize design. And you know, if we're really honest, that's how we've taught in our churches. Uh, taught in our Sunday schools, taught in our youth groups, uh, that we can see the evidence that God created. Design implies a designer. And that's certainly been the way that we've taught for many, many years. And certainly it's a powerful argument. It's what Romans 1.20 is all about. But you know something? I believe today that we need to go to a much deeper level when talking to this world about uh, the, the fact of creation. Tell you why. If you take uh, Dr. Richard Dawkins, he's an ardent evolutionist from England. And Dr. Dawkins, who's an ardent evolutionist, said this, we have seen that living things are too improbable and too beautifully designed to have come into existence by chance. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, as an evolutionist, of course I'd expect things to look designed. After all, as the evolutionary process produces animals and plants and so on, uh, they're going to be adapted to their environment, so they're going to look designed because they're going to be fit for their environment. So of course you'd expect design. So you see the evolutionists say, the design argument, oh no, that doesn't mean there's a God. 
And so in our churches today, we need to make sure that we actually counteract where the world is at. In other words, we have now got to go to a much deeper level in being able to logically defend in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. I remember as a teacher when I taught my students about design and taught them that design implied a designer and therefore, you know, it's obvious there's a God. Can't scientifically prove it to you, but the evidence is consistent within the beginning God. When the teacher, teacher in the other classroom had the students, she would say to the, the students, oh, look, Mr. Ham doesn't know what he's talking about. Why not? Well, you see, with, with life, it's different. Life is built up on the basis of that molecule of heredity, you know, DNA. You've all heard of DNA, haven't you? You see, the DNA we have has the information that builds us. In fact, if you were to take just one of your cells that has all the information that builds you and type it all out, it's been estimated it would fill something like 1,000 books, 500 pages, close type written. They now think that's way underestimated. That's a lot of, lot of information, isn't it? Where did the information come from? Ah, says the teacher, it's like this. You see, as an analogy, DNA is sort of like a long piece of rope with little beads on it, those molecules that write all the information that builds you. It, it's sort of like this. Take the Morse code. You've all heard of the Morse code, haven't you? Well, if we were to get a piece of rope and have some dots and dashes, beads representing dots and dashes, using the Morse code, you could write the word help. Or you could write the entire Bible. As long as you know the Morse code and you've got enough beads and dashes and got a piece of rope, then you could write all that information. Well, in a similar sort of way, as a sort of a crude analogy, our DNA is like long pieces of rope, if you like, they have little beads on the molecules that write all the information that builds you. And the teacher said, see, you don't need God. As long as those molecules lined up in the right order, over, over time, it happened by chance, uh, you see, you could get life. Look, let's do an analogy, students. And so the teacher would say, let's take a hat and let's put the letters of the alphabet in a hat, A to Z or A to Z, as we say in Australia. <laughs> don't know how you people got the language all wrong over here in America. But anyway, a, we'll say A to Z, because this is an American audience, right? <laughs> a to Z, put them in a hat, and then pass the hat around the class, class and ask students to pull out letters from the hat. And by chance, in a row, they pulled out a B, followed by A, followed by T. What's that word? Bat. Ah, says the teacher, we got a word by chance. Given enough time, we could get a sequence of words by chance. Given enough time, we could get sentences. As improbable as it seems, nonetheless, there's always the possibility, given enough time, you could get the right order, we could eventually get the encyclopedia. You see, students, you don't need God. All you need is the right order, and you could get life. There it is. And then the students would come back to me and say, oh, Mr. Ham, you don't need God. It's obvious. Ah, wait a minute. There's something dreadfully wrong with that analogy. Do you know what's dreadfully wrong with that analogy? I want you to think about this. Who is that a word to, B-A-T? Is it a word to a Frenchman or a Dutchman or an Englishman or a Chinese or a Japanese? It's only a word to somebody who already has what? The language. For instance, take these letters, T-A-G-E. I wonder how many people know what that means. If you're a German, you'll know that it means days. But if you don't know the German language, the order is meaningless, isn't it? And you see, that's the whole point. The order of molecules in our DNA is meaningless, except for the fact that there's something else that we have in the cell. You know what it is? In the cell, there's actually a language system. There are other chemicals that constitute a language system that actually makes the order of molecules in the DNA meaningful. That language system reads the DNA to make it meaningful. And you know what? By doing that, it also makes it meaningful to make the language system that reads the DNA to make the language system to read the DNA to make the language system to read the DNA. <laughs> Do you realize what that means? You've got to have the language system, but you've got to have the order of molecules, but you've got to have the language system, but you've got to have the order of molecules. You've got to have it all together or it won't work. It's sort of like a machine. I remember flying back from Australia with my wife in a 747. She was reading a book about the 747. And she said, do you realize the 747 is made of six million parts? I said, oh, interesting. She said, do you realize not one part flies? Do you know how disconcerting that is at 35,000 feet? When you're flying in something, you realize not one part of this airplane flies. <laughs> but when it's all together as a machine, guess what? It works, doesn't it? It works. You know life is like that? Life is like that at a number of different levels. For instance, take a mosquito, all right? Do you know what I like to do with mosquitoes? In Australia, we call them mozzies. Do you know what I like to do to mozzies? <laughs> I like to squash them. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this. Okay, here we have a squashed mozzie. And my question for you is this. Why did the mosquito die? 
Very, very, very important question. Why do the mosquito die? I mean, you have a look at that. You've got the best primeval soup you could ever ask for for an evolutionist. I mean, you've got all the DNA and RNA, you've got all these molecules, all these enzymes, these proteins, everything's all there. But it's not going to get up and fly away, is it? I mean, do you know why the mosquito died? Because I disorganized it. And, and because, because I disorganized it, right, it now can't pull itself together, can it? It's not going to get up and, and, and fly away. Look, it's sort of, let me give you another analogy. Take a frog. You can put a frog in a blender. Now, I don't encourage you to do this, okay? <laughs> but if you put a frog, frog in a blender, <laughs> you'll end up with a uh, blended frog, I guess. <laughs> but you know, that frog is not, not going to get up and crawl away. And yet, when you think about it, all the bits of the frog are there, aren't they? But unless they're all together in the right place at the right time, the way they're supposed to be, it's not going to work. Just like a machine, just like a 747. Do you know what is fascinating? Not only is, is life like that when you, when you consider our body, you know, everything has to be all there at the right place at the right time to make it work, like a mosquito, like a frog. But when we get down into the biochemistry of a cell, in, in, into the very inner workings of a cell, do you know what we find? There's really literally, in a sense, thousands of 747s to make life work. There's a man called Dr. Michael Behe. He's not a biblical creationist like me, but he's a professor of biochemistry at a university in America, and he wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And in that book, what he was saying was this. You know, for instance, give you an example. Just for a, a, an organism to sense light and turn it into electrical impulses, takes this chemical and this one, 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 page after page after page, all these chemicals, all the right place, all the right concentration, all the right time, or right at the right location, all together, or it won't work. You know what that's called? A biochemical machine. And you know, for, for life to work, you've got thousands and thousands of these biochemical machines. In other words, you've got to start with machines. So do you know what Dr. Behe says? You've got to believe in God. You can't believe in chance random processes, because life has to start with machines. In fact, there's a couple of very interesting quotes from his book, Darwin's Black Box. He says this, now it's a turn of the fundamental science of life, modern biochemistry, to disturb. The simplicity that was once expected to be a foundation of life has proven to be a phantom. Instead, systems of horrendous, irreducible complexity inhabit the cell. The resulting realization that life was designed by an intelligence is a shock to us in the 20th century who have gotten used to thinking of life as a result of simple natural laws. Well, it's not a shock to me, uh, being a creationist, of course. In the beginning, God created. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But other centuries have had their shocks, and there is no reason to suppose that we should escape them. And he goes on and says this, the fourth and most powerful reason for science's reluctance to embrace a theory of intelligent design is also based on philosophical considerations. You know what that means? It's got nothing to do with evidence. It's what they believe to start with. And that's an important part of this lecture I want you to keep at the back of your mind. He says, many people, including many important and well-respected scientists, just don't want there to be anything beyond nature. They don't want a supernatural being to affect nature, no matter how brief or constructive the interaction may have been. And you know why that is? Remember what we said at the beginning? In the beginning, God, what's that mean? There's a God who created us, he owns us, we're accountable to him. In the beginning, the cosmos, what's that mean? It means we're not accountable to anyone but ourselves. And that's really why people don't want to believe in God despite the evidence. But you know, there's something else here too. As well as the fact that we've got to account for these machines, there's something else that's very important. Where did the information system come from in the first place? Where did the language system come from in the first place that, that reads our DNA? Well, you know, there's a man in Germany, a professor, Professor Werner Gitt, and he wrote a book called In the Beginning Was Information. And I want to read a, some quotes from Dr. Werner Gitt, very, very important. He says this, there is no known law of nature, no known process, no known sequence of events which can cause information to originate by itself in matter. Do you realize what he's saying? What we observe in the real world, in science today, is that there is no mechanism for matter to generate information by itself. It can't happen. And he goes on and says this, there is no known natural law through which matter can give rise to information, neither is any physical process or material phenomenon known that can do this. In other words, do you know what Dr. Uh, Gitt is telling us here? In the real world, what we've observed thus far as scientists is that information only comes from information, previously existing information, and ultimately it has to come from an intelligence. And he says as far as he's concerned, he's going to make that a law until sh someone shows him an observation to the contrary. Information only comes from information. So you see, when you put all that together that I've just gone through with you, when those students would come up to me at school and say, hey, sir, where did God come from? How do you know there's a God? Who made God? 
I would go through all of that with them. What I'm really doing is logically defending that you have to have an intelligence to start with. See, I'd say to Johnny, Johnny, where did the information come from in ourselves? It would have to come from a greater amount of information. Where would that come from? A greater amount of gain. Where would that come from? A greater amount of gain. Where would that come from? A greater amount of gain. You know the only thing that makes logical sense to me? You start with infinite information. And ultimately, as Dr. Gitt said, information comes from an intelligence. So to me, an infinite intelligence makes sense. In fact, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God is the most scientific statement you could ever make because it fits with real science that we use in the present, our observations in the present. Information comes from information, ultimately from an intelligence. I can't scientifically prove the existence of God to you, Johnny, but I can logically defend in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and it fits with what we observe in the present world. But let me ask you a question, Johnny. What do you believe? Do you believe matter existed eternally? Do you believe matter by itself turned into information systems? Did matter just come about by itself? Uh, and then it arranged itself into information systems against everything we observe in science? I'm sorry, Billy, you've got a problem. You see, Billy, you've got a blind faith. You have to believe that something happened opposite to what we observe today. You have to believe that matter generated a code, that matter generated information system. Whereas, Johnny, I don't have a blind faith. I have a faith that fits the facts of science. I have a faith consistent with what we observe in the real world, that information comes from information. I can logically defend my faith, Johnny. You can't logically defend your faith. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's what fits with our observations in the present world. That makes sense with real science. Johnny, I think you better listen to verse 2. Isn't it exciting being a Christian? It really is, isn't it? Because we can defend our faith. Now, you might say to me, well, look, if it's so obvious as a God, and Paul in Romans 1 says it's obvious as a God, why don't people believe that? You know what the Bible tells us? They don't want to believe it. In fact, in 2 Peter 3, Peter says, people are willingly ignorant. They deliberately reject the truth. They don't want to believe. You say, but are scientists really like that? Absolutely. You know, sometimes I think we get the wrong idea about things because we think scientists are out there, neutral people searching for truth. You know, the Bible says all of us have a problem. It's called sin. And the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But let me give you an example. Here's a professor... Richard Lewontin, a Harvard geneticist. So he's a professor at a leading university, secular university in America. And here's what he says. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produces a material explanations, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. And now look at this. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. You know what he's saying? I don't care what observations we see that go against what I believe. I don't care how contradictory it is. I'm not going to believe in God. I am my a priori uh, assumption is materialism. I believe that matter is all, it is, all, all, all that there is. I don't believe in the supernatural. I believe that matter somehow formed us regardless of the observations out there. I'm not going to believe in God. How is that for a neutral scientist? <laughs> Isn't that a great example of 2 Peter 3? How men are willingly ignorant of the truth, deliberately reject. Sort of reminds me of the time when the SETI project was in the news a lot, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, searching for life in outer space. You know, I remember uh, quite a number of years ago when somebody in England was listening to outer space and they heard some pulses one and one third second apart and they called the source LGM, LGM-1. They, it stood for little green men, because <laughs> they facetiously thought, May maybe there's little green men out there, because you got this signal from outer space. Well, later on, they found out they had been listening to the first pulsar or neutron star. But you know what's fascinating to me? We're listening to outer space for some sort of signal to tell us you know, that there's, there's uh, some intelligence out there, hopefully. If scientists were to turn their telescopes into microscopes and look at our DNA, you have the most complex information system, signal if you like, or more than a signal, it's an information system, code system, that you could ever find in the entire universe, and they look at that and say, chance, 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 and they hear blip, 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 and they say, there's intelligence out there. <laughs> Something wrong with that, isn't there? <laughs> I remember in the newspaper at the time, there was an interesting quote uh, back in 1993, 
And the quote said this, some speculate that alien intelligence might beam vast streams of coded information of virtual Encyclopedia Galactica with insights into the origin of the universe or immortality. Well, guess what? I believe a vast intelligence has already streamed that in. <laughs> in fact, an inf infinite intelligence has revealed to us insights about the origin of the universe. I mean, it's already here. I smiled when I was reading in Carl Sagan's book, The Cosmic Con Connection, the following quote. Carl Sagan said this, at this very moment, the messages from another civilization may be wafting across space, driven by our unimaginably advanced devices. They're for us to detect them. If only we knew how. How about read? <laughs> or perhaps the messages are already here, present in some everyday experience we have not made the right mental effort to recognize. Hmm, how about a book? <laughs> <laughs> the power of such an advanced civilization is very great. How about an infinite power? <laughs> Their messages may lie in quite familiar circumstances. Pages. The messages from the stars may be already here, but where? Has somebody told us where we came from and who we are? I want, you know, you can imagine Carl Sagan's really saying, I want somebody to tell me where we came from and who we are and what life's all about. It's right here in a book. No, I want a little green man to tell me where we came from. <laughs> very, very sad, isn't it? That's another example of men are willingly ignorant of the truth. Because you see, the bottom line is this. If there's Adam in our ancestry, if God made us, if we're all descendants of the first man, Adam, as the Bible talks about, then who owns us? God does. Who sets the rules? God. But if we're a product of chance, random processes, if we're just an animal in this struggle for survival, who owns us? We do. Who sets the rules? We do. In fact, you know Charles Darwin, who popularized the idea of evolution? Charles Darwin said this in his autobiography. He said, a man who has no assured and ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or of a future existence with retribution and reward can have for this rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. In other words, you know what he's saying? If there's no God, then man has a right to do whatever he wants to do. And that's why people want to believe in evolution. That's why they don't want to believe in the beginning God, even though it's so obvious as a God. I'll give you an example of what evolution does to people's thinking. You might remember Jeffrey Dahmer, said to be the most notorious killer uh, of our day. He died in, in jail. He was murdered himself. He was interviewed on a television program in America and asked the question, Jeffrey Dahmer, why did you do what you did? And here's what he said. If a person doesn't think there's a God to be accountable to, then what's the point of trying to modify your behavior to keep within acceptable ranges? That's how I thought anyway. I always believed the theory of evolution is truth, that we all just came from slime. When we died, you know, that was it. There's nothing. You see what he's saying? I was taught evolution. I was taught I just came from slime. If that's true, I'm accountable to no one but myself. I can do whatever I want to do if I can get away with it. And why not? And look what he did. You know the sad thing? We have whole generations being trained up in our culture through an education system today telling them there's no God, you're just an animal. Should we be surprised when we see people starting to act like animals? Should we be surprised when we see them having what seems to be no basis for Christian morality. You see, as a Christian, you know why we believe the way we do? Why do we believe in right and wrong? Because God is creator, and he sets the rules. Why do we believe in marriage? Because God's the one that created marriage, one man for one woman for life. We know what life's all about. We have a worldview because we have that foundation in God's word, and that God is creator. But you see, if you build your life on a different foundation, that there's no God, that man is just an animal, man is a result of chance random processes, then who sets the rules? You do. Why not do what you want with sex? Why not abort babies? Get rid of spare cats, get rid of spare kids. What's the difference? And if you look at our Western nations today, our nations that were once pervaded by Christian morality, you look at them today and you see the collapse of Christianity. And you really do. You see increasing abortion, homosexual behavior, lawlessness, euthanasia, suicide. And you say, what's happening to our nations? What's gone wrong? What's gone wrong is this. We've replaced the foundation that God is creator with a foundation that says man decides truth for himself. And at a foundational level, that's really creation versus evolution, isn't it? Because once you say there's no God who's the absolute authority, and you replace it with a foundation that says man is just a product of evolutionary processes in the beginning the cosmos, then who owns you? You do, so you have a right to do whatever you want to do. I like to sum up what's going on in our, in our nations with two castle diagrams. Here's the first castle diagram. We have the foundation of evolution, man decides truth. See, evolution is not just the idea of molecules to man, it's a whole way of thinking that man decides truth. That's really what evolution's all about, that man, independent of God, decides truth. 
Built on that foundation is the castle of humanism. Out of that come the issues like abortion, homosexual behavior, lawlessness, suicide, racism, and so on. On the other side, we have the foundation of creation. God's word is truth and the castle of Christianity. You know, the humanists have been very clever. How do you get rid of Christian morality? It's very simple. If you knock out the foundation that there's a God who created, then there is no foundation for Christian morality. And how do you do that? You knock out the foundation that the Bible is the authority of the Word of God. And how do you start doing that? From the very first verse. If you can say the first verse is not true in the Bible, in the beginning God created, then neither is the rest. And you know, that foundation has been by and large removed from our, from our Western nations in, that, that were once very Christian in the, in, in the whole philosophy. America was a Christian nation in the past. And what are the Christians doing? The Christians recognize there's something wrong. Look at all these problems, abortion, homosexual behavior, lawlessness, euthanasia, suicide, and so on. There's something wrong. What are we going to do? And, and so they're out there and they shoot at each other and shoot into nowhere and shoot themselves in the foot by, by compromising actually with evolution. There's a lot of Christians who say, well, maybe we can believe in evolution, somehow add that to the Bible. But you know, and, and, they're, and they're fighting the issues like abortion and so on. But you know what they're not doing? They're not recognizing the real problem is the change in foundation from God's word to man's word. And you see, when Christians compromise with evolution, what they're really doing is adding man's ideas to the Bible, and they're really telling the world, we don't have to take the Bible as written. We can take man's ideas and use that to interpret the Bible. If you do that, then the Bible is no longer the absolute authority of the, of the Word of God, is it? It means we have a right to tell God what He means instead of letting God tell us what He said. And so the solution is that we need to get out there and restore the absolute authority of the Word of God and not use the fallible theories of men to interpret the Word of God, but to show people that this is the Word of God right from the very first verse, to restore that foundation and knock out the foundation of evolution. And it's only then that we'll be able to fight those weapons and fight those issues. That's where the real battle is at, right at that foundational basis there of creation versus evolution. You know, there's a couple of books that I would highly recommend to you that deal with this particular topic. We have a little booklet called, Is There Really a God? This is one of our witnessing booklets for today's world. And another book that I would highly recommend to you is a book called, Refuting Evolution. It's a book that is a critique of the major evidences used for evolution in our schools and colleges today. Well, I hope that each one of us now can go out there and say, in the beginning God created, and that's not a blind faith, that's a logically defensible faith, and that we'll know how to show others who don't believe in the beginning God created that they're the ones that have a blind faith. Isn't it great being a Christian? Thank you.